Hello, I'm Setsuko Sato and welcome to English Conversations 2. This week we will be introducing an American who, although he is very well known in the United States, enjoys an especially high level of esteem in Japan. We are here at New York's famous Columbia University and we will be talking to Professor Donald Keene. We hope you'll enjoy it. Professor Donald Keene is one of the foremost scholars on East Asian studies, particularly Japan. He has received many awards and honors for his scholarship, including a center for Japanese culture named after him at Columbia University. He is the author of numerous books and he has translated the works of some of Japan's most famous writers. However, one of his most engaging books may be Nihon to no Deai, which describes his extraordinary life. He is currently the University Professor and Shincho Professor of Japanese at Columbia University. Hello, Professor Keene. Hello, how are you? Okay. Um, it's very nice meeting you today, and um, you. we'd like to thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Um, could you start by telling us where you grew up and how you became interested in Japanese culture? I grew up in New York. I was born in 1922. Uh, which makes me, alas, uh, 17 years old this year. Congratulations. Uh, no, no congratulations. <laughs> and uh, I went to Columbia University, uh, where I entered very young. I was only 16 years old when I became a freshman at Columbia. Mm, and uh, my interest in Japanese literature happened um, as the result of an interest in Chinese literature, or Chinese language, which I started at that time. While I was at Columbia, my first year in Columbia, uh, next to me was seated a Chinese, and uh, this was uh, the course called Humanities, which met four times a week at nine o'clock in the morning. And being next to a Chinese, the first Chinese I'd ever known in my whole life, I began to talk to him, became interested in him. And then I discovered towards the end of the year that uh, he had few friends in New York and had no particular plans for the summer. So I suggested that we go swimming together. We went to a beach which is called Reese Park. Uh, I don't know if it's as nice as it was then, but it was a very <laughs> nice place to go. And we were very friendly. But he was going to become an engineer, and my interest was in literature. So there weren't too many topics we had in common. And I had the bright idea of asking him to teach me Chinese characters. And he would write them in the sand, and I would imitate them. And this became more and more interesting to me. And so when the next school year began, I asked him if, if he would teach me uh, after we had lunch t together. We ate in a Chinese restaurant. The Chinese restaurant survived until last year when finally it went out of business. Oh, but what a shame. What a shame. <laughs> uh, but w every day we would have lunch there, and after lunch he would teach me more Chinese characters. And uh, I was fascinated with it. And I learned from him how to use a brush and write characters. And this went on for about two years when I decided to study Chinese seriously as a student. Uh, later on, uh, this interest extended to Japan. And uh, my interest in Japanese literature began by another accident, and that was, uh, at that time, there was a big bookshop in Times Square where they sold remainders, books that were uh, left over uh, at a greatly reduced price. And I saw the tale of Genji in, in the Arthur Whaley translation on sale there for, I think it was 49 cents. And looking at the number of pages and thinking of the price, I thought it was a great bargain. <laughs> so I bought it then without much thought about it. In fact, I was rather anti-Japanese at the time, because at that time there was a war going on between China, my friend's country, and Japan, uh, and I didn't think I should uh, like things Japanese. But the <laughs> The tale of Genji completely won me over. I was uh, enchanted by it. And one other thing, which was, that was a very hard, difficult time for everybody, 1940. It was the year when the uh, German armies overran uh, Holland, Belgium, France, uh, the beginning of the Battle of Britain, and we were all very uh, apprehensive what might happen. And I took refuge in the world of the tale of Genji. I read the tale of Genji, if you like, as a kind of escape from my own life, from the, the world of 1940. 
And so it had a very special meaning for me. It was, it was a world where people were civilized, there was no warfare, no terrible things were going on. Uh, a world without any real bad people and where there was a great deal of consideration given to creation of beauty, creation of things that were of lasting value. You were in the Navy from 1942 to 46. What was your involvement in the war? Uh, first of all, I uh, went into the uh, Navy Japanese language school. When, when the war broke out in December of 1941, I heard a radio broadcast saying uh, that there are only 50 people in the whole of the United States who knew Japanese. Later on, I realized this was absurd because there were 100,000, 200,000 Japanese Americans who knew <laughs> Japanese, but I didn't think about it. And I thought uh, I'd learned a little Japanese. Uh, perhaps that would be of some use. And I wrote to the Navy. I'd heard they had a school. And then in the beginning of February, I was asked, to go to the west coast to Berkeley where there was a Japanese language school. The school was later moved from Berkeley to Boulder, Colorado because of the evacuation of the Japanese from the west coast. Our teachers were all Japanese so we were evacuated too. And uh, the school, when, when we attended it, there was a great need for people. So we had 11 months of extremely intensive study of Japanese after which uh, people were sent to, to various places. I was sent to Hawaii where I spent um, about two years on and off. I also uh, took part in campaigns in the North Pacific, the islands of Attu and Kiska, and then towards the end of the war, uh, I took part in the Okinawa campaign from beginning to end. My work was mainly translation, mm -hmm. uh, and within the domain of translation, I uh, specialized in reading Japanese diaries. Mm. Uh, most people tried to avoid the diaries because they were hard to read, they were handwriting, sometimes smudgy, uh, sometimes they had blood stains on them. Oh. They were <laughs> diaries picked up uh, either in the field or from the corpses of killed Japanese soldiers. It was a very unpleasant thing to think about, but uh, the diaries were full of human interest and they absorbed my, my attention. Uh, mm -hmm. And even though they were difficult, they were worthwhile doing, whereas the diaries the, the documents describing uh, equipment or such like things were extremely boring. I also interpreted and, and saw quite a lot of Japanese prisoners of war with whom I became very friendly. In fact, I'm still friendly with some of the <coughs> prisoners of war I knew at that time. Oh, so you never engaged in combat or anything I like never that. Uh, fired a gun, but I went to the front lines with a megaphone on occasion to, to, to tell the Japanese to surrender. It was useless to go on fighting. I don't think it had much effect, but <laughs> I was pretty frightened. <laughs> what have you done since you left the Navy? Well, that's a long time ago. That was in 1946. So you can imagine how long it is. Well, first of all, I decided I should get a doctor's degree, and I got one eventually at Columbia. I taught for five years in England at Cambridge University, taught Japanese there. And then in 1953, my dreams came true, and I was able to study in Japan. I studied for two years in Kyoto. And then after that, I managed in one way or another, with great difficulty, to find enough money to go to Japan each summer during the Columbia vacation. Or I should have said I got a job at Columbia after I left Cambridge. And since then, I've spot, spent part of every single year in Japan, sometimes the whole year, sometimes only three or four months. But uh, it's been important to me to keep up with what's been going on in Japan, find out what the Japanese are thinking. Of course, there have been enormous changes in the last 35 years in Japan, and I feel very privileged to have seen them all. Opinion, 
how has Japan changed since the war? And um, where does that leave Japan vis-a-vis -vis the world? Well, the changes are exist in two different forms. One is material change, which has been enormous. The other is spiritual change, which has been almost as great. The material change I, I can think of in terms of the city of Kyoto, as it was in 1953. Fortunately, it had not been bombed. But uh, almost none of the streets were paved. And a few of them had only uh, a track in the middle where the where the uh, densha, the, the trams <laughs> ran. That was the only part of the whole street that would be paved. And most of the shopkeepers along the streets spent most of their time sprinkling water over the streets <laughs> okay. to keep the dust from rising. The spiritual changes were different. At that time, I think the Japanese felt a kind of uh, awareness of the failure of Japanese culture. And people often ask me, uh, to scold them or to tell them what was wrong with Japan or they would say things like I'm sure you find life in Japan very inconvenient I'm sure that the trains in your country run much faster I'm <laughs> sure that uh, the food in your country tastes much better and so on uh, this was a, a kind of masochism which I found very distressing I, 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 I tried to give them confidence I said, would say no the food is fine here as a matter of fact <laughs> It, compared to the English food I'd been eating for five years be immediately before going to Japan, the Japanese food was, was delicious. There was no rationing or <laughs> anything I wanted. But in any case, the Japanese uh, felt very aware of the fact that, they, that their position was not strong, very weak in the world. I went to a, a conference as an interpreter of the Institute of Pacific Relations, which was held in Kyoto. And at that time, leading Japanese economists said that Japan was doomed, that nothing could ever improve the situation <laughs> in Japan. If, uh, for example, there was some sort of uh, improvement in the lot of the working class, this would result in higher prices for Japanese goods. And the only reason Japanese goods sold abroad was because they were cheap. Uh, I don't think anybody thinks along those lines anymore. The Japanese believe that Japanese goods sell because they're superior in quality. Uh, no one ever asks me anymore to criticize Japan. Nobody says to me, I'm sure trains in America are much faster than those <laughs> in Japan, because they know they're not. Okay. Uh, it's an entirely different situation. The Japanese have acquired confidence, sometimes one might say a little bit too much confidence, but, uh, and the material life there, although still in some ways uh, not as good as in other countries, I'm thinking particularly the smallness of Japanese apartments and the bleakness of these places. Uh, still, the uh, material life insofar as food, clothing, uh, pleasures, entertainment, and so on, is certainly uh, equal to that in almost any country in the world. Um, actually, I've heard some concerns about Japanese youth. Yes. That the older generation um, had a sense of self-sacrifice, um, which the younger generation doesn't. Um, does this concern you in any way? Nobody knows about this. Uh, the Japanese of a uh, hundred years ago thought that the younger generation does, uh, are not uh, willing to sacrifice <laughs> themselves. The Japanese of 1890, as reflected in the writings of Lafcadio O'Hearn, were much less diligent than the Japanese of 20 years before. People always make the, that complaint. It's never new. <laughs> I think if there were really a crisis, uh, even a small crisis such as existed at the time of the so-called oil shock, the Japanese young people are quite prepared to make sacrifices. But why make sacrifices at a time when prosperity is general? Uh, I don't think that's correct. It's the kind You're of nostalgia right. that people of my age feel uh, <laughs> about their own past. Right, exactly. Um, well, as we speak today, uh, it seems like the, it's a high tension period between the United States and Japan. Um, how do you feel about that and wh how, what we should do about it? Uh, I'm not the right person really to answer the question, but I'll try my best. The reason I'm not the right person is that the high tension doesn't exist with respect to culture. Uh, there is no difficulty about uh, getting a, a, a book about Japan published. People are interested in, in translations of Japanese literature. They're interested in books about Japanese culture. They're interested in going to Japan. Americans want to see Japan. Uh, if a Japanese uh, company of actors come here, the, the people want to see it, they enjoy it. Uh, Japanese objects of art are much admired. 
uh, there's no feeling of hostility on a, a cultural level. The hostility is uh, on an economic level, and uh, that's something I have no direct concern with. It's also uh, a, a matter of com communication. How do people express things? How do they uh, communicate their, their feelings about another country? For example, the Japanese who say about America that they don't work hard enough or that they, because of the, the um, multiple strains in the American population, there's no sense of unity as there is in Japan. Perhaps they're telling the truth, but it's the wrong thing to say because it, it will offend many people. It will antagonize them in many ways. This is the, the, the kind of criticism that should be kept to oneself. If, on the other hand, they were to speak in more friendly terms about desiring to cooperate and help together, do things together, I think that would solve many of the problems as far as uh, relations between the two countries. On the other hand, the Americans should also uh, stop talking about uh, Japanese encroachment on the markets because after all, uh, it's free co competition. If the goods are superior, the American consumers will buy them. The American consumer does not buy Japanese goods because he hates American goods. He buys them because they're superior in quality and it's up to the Americans to improve the quality. This is what I say is an amateur, an outsider. Uh, again, my own field, uh, there's no problem of that kind. Nobody uh, in the field of Japanese uh, studies in this country is anti-Japanese. We're all uh, friendly uh, towards Japan and we hope that the relations become more and more intimate. How do you see the conflicts being resolved between the two countries? I don't really know. Uh, I think that if the Japanese were to do certain things, the Americans would do certain things, it would certainly help. For example, at one point, let's say about 20 or more years ago, the Japanese produced a series of absolutely marvelous films. And these were shown in this country with great success. But of late, uh, there have been so few good films, uh, good films that show what the Japanese are really like. I think the production of such films, I'm not talking about propaganda, but, but really good films would be one way, reaching American public through television. It, it's, it's, a, it's an effective way. Uh, there is also now already founded something called the Library of Japan, which is to be a, a series of books which every American who's interested in Japan could possess, which describe not which show not only the literature but the polit politics, uh, the intellectual history, and every other aspect of Japanese civilization. Having such a collection, even if people don't buy it individually but only use the library copy, will be a, a, an important step forward. There should be more money for fellowships for the people to go from one country to the other. The Americans should do the same. The Americans have been doing this longer than the Japanese, but they. Should the Americans should not begrudge the money because it's terribly important that cultural contacts be extended, not just maintained, but extended, so that uh, the prejudices that come up because of economic difficulties, whatever, can be overcome. Well, um, it was a very nice meeting with you. Very nice and to meet you. And thank you for giving us this time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.